Wesley Snipes is the GOAT. He has some history with my mom back in the day. They used to date back before he got his big break. I was working on Players, which was the little TV show that he was a part of. I remember coming in after my fitting to go see him. And I'm like, hey, so you do you remember a, Tr a Tracy? Like a Tracy Robinson? He was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, back in the day you went to SUNY Purchase. You know, I, I started throwing all this old facts and old, old information. He's like, yeah, I was like, yeah, so it's nice to meet you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> he froze so hard. I was like, I'm wow, kidding. Is, but you used to date my mom. That was mean, but awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was so mean, but I, I, I had to get him. Now, before I kill your name, it is um, Zgi, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Gee the Silver Green. Yes, Gee the Silver Green. Now, so I've actually been a fan of Corridor Crew. And um, then I see, um, you know, you started to get the stunt. Yeah, the stunt and reacts. You know, and I saw you pop up on there. I'm like, man, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, those guys are cool. Uh, it's funny, I met them uh, years ago. Uh, I did one of their, like, they did, like, a Rayman skit. Mm -hmm. And I got pulled in to be one of the guys in it. So that, that was, like, my first meeting to them. Let's fast forward, like, four or five years. And oh. I'm shooting with Wes and Kel Mitchell, uh, the little skit that they did for The Blash and Pantro. Tantro, son of Pantro. Um, and we were shooting it there. And they were actually editing at the time... Uh, what if Marvel was rated R and they yeah. did the opening sequence of Civil War? And he was like, Yo, my boy's in this. Wes was talking to him. He was like, My boy's in this. And I was like, Oh, where? He's like, Yeah, he's right here. It's key. And I was like, Yeah, I was a double. And they're like, Oh, shit, we got to get you in. <laughs> and, you know, and then they hit me up about this Stuntman React video afterwards. And I thought that was like, I was like, Oh, hell yeah. And it just became something fun and cool to do. Yeah, you know? Sweet. So obviously, um, they're based in LA also. Yep. What's your, um, your martial arts disciplines, what got you into them? Um, my first discipline, I would say, is Taekwondo. Uh, I got into it when I was around two years old, a little too young to actually join the actual school. But uh, I had my godfather and my father who were into martial arts and they had black belts, respectively, and they would show me stuff. And I got introduced to it because I was shown a Bruce Lee movie, uh, mm -hmm. Return of the Dragon. And watching him fight Chuck Norris and him fighting in the in the back alleyway, I, it immediately was something that resonated with me, I guess, at that age. And I knew at that point that that's what I wanted to be and that's what I wanted to do. So pushing forward, I got introduced to Capoeira when I was six years old. Oh. Um, my older brother, Omi, he does it. He's a contra master out of New York. He has a group with my cousin, uh, Shem. And like... As I went to after school programs, they introduced me to Kung Fu, they introduced me to Ninjutsu, they introduced me to Jiu Jitsu, Judo, so on and so forth. But my main focus has always been Taekwondo up until I was about maybe 16 years old. Uh, I was trained for the Olympics and I got injured mm. and kind of it kind of put me on the back burner, put martial arts still in my heart, still loved it, but just... I could no longer like just put my whole life and devote my whole self to it. I what kind like, of injury was that? Uh, MCL and ACL. Mm. Yeah, that'd do good it. old knee. The good old knee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that kind of sucked. Um, I had, you know, just after I got back into, after I healed up, I, I moved back to New York, living with my mom. Mm -hmm. I will continue to train and stuff like that. And I, I, you know, just being a kid in New York. And living in Harlem, my mom would just try to keep me in as many things as possible to keep me out of trouble. So along with doing martial arts, I did gymnastics. I was in dance classes and so on and so forth. And that's how I kind of, uh, I guess, gave me the skill sets to where I am now and put me in the trajectory. Towards Definitely. Where Sweet. And speaking of um, that trajectory, um, and what made you... Now, let's skip to it. What gave you, what was your first big break? What would you consider as far my, as um, in the industry? In the industry, uh, my first real big break in, enter in the entertainment industry, I would say, um, was 
junior year, well, my first break was junior year of high school. I met my mentor, Doug Elkins, who runs a contemporary dance company. And he mentored me and groomed, and groomed me in his uh, contemporary dance company, which had a show called Fraulein Maria at the time, which, com- which was a seasonal show during Christmas. It would come up at Joe's Pub. And it was ranked right with uh, the, what shows to go to during the holidays with the American Ballet. Mm. So a small contemporary company being that kind of having that kind of fame or that kind of uh, notoriety, I guess um, it, it, it gave me that, I guess it gave me that juice to keep going and to stay in the industry and say, you know, whereas like most people would get like a, a regular job or go to retail at the age of 17, 16, which I tried. I tried (laughs) to do that. I tried. I worked at American apparel and that did not, that did not go well. Yeah, it's um, not for everybody. <laughs> no, it's not. It really isn't. And uh, so when I was doing that, I was also doing little little stuff, being an assistant for BT 106 and Park. Oh, snap. Uh, I would just run around, get people coffee, you know, help with the audience and stuff like that. Um, so I kind of was starting to, like, make my little, little touches into the industry that way, um, outside the stage. And... I I guess then the next big thing would would have been uh, me getting called into dance behind Chris Brown. Mm. So I danced behind Chris Brown for about two years, three years. Uh, that that actually got me to move to Los Angeles. Um, it's funny because I didn't have money to move in, and it was five five guys in a two bedroom house, mm. and the money that I got to li- to move out there was actually from me being on Silent Library. <laughs> uh back on the back in the day when it was on mtv zero kazama hooked that up uh and so i'm dancing and i've been introduced to scream fighting a little bit by by the people i'm training at the gym uh like john true out of new york with jim ang out of new york at aviator gym and it's something that i want but it's in the back burner because I'm dancing now. I'm dancing behind Chris Brown. So I train at White Lotus Gym. I train at Jam, all owned by Travis Wong uh, and Aaron Tony. Uh, and they're also like a lot of people go to that gym who do stunts. Mm-hmm. And so you're just naturally going to end up training with these people and they're going to see your talent and see what you can do. And at the time I was a martial arts tricker and they're like oh you're dope and i love i love screen fighting i love pretend fighting now because i did the real fighting i did the for sport you know right that, and and that's cool but nothing beats not getting actually kicked in the face or having to kick somebody in the face yeah, no, and, <laughs> and um so I da- i'm dancing with chris and i'm like you know i need to really go back to what it is i want to do because dancing is really fun being on tour is really great i've learned so much um, I've given so much and I want to actually go towards my dream and my goal. So I started making YouTube right. videos and being a part of other YouTube videos like, uh, by Vlad Brimberg, uh, Emmanuel Manzanares of LBP Stunts Chicago, Ooh. uh, Chris Cowan, thousand pounds, uh, Riven X3I. Those are the guys, the, that's the team that we did UALA with. Um, I mean, I'm part of that team. So, I mean, I'm, that, that's my team. With the right. Team. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you mentioned, um, sorry, Mr. Chicago. Yeah, uh, that's why I'm. That's where I'm from. Actually, I'm not a Texan. I just live here. Oh, dope. But uh, yeah. Oh um, yeah. And, and one more thing, uh, Chris Brown. Um, yeah. Nice guy. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Um, you know, he's like, it sucks being in that limelight, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to when you're trying to grow and find yourself, especially in your twenties, like yeah. we all make mistakes when we're 16, 17, 18, 19. Definitely. And it, it just doesn't help that you have a spotlight. So that way, every time you do make a mistake, it's like, boom, now the whole world is looking at you and, and not a lot. And we're, and we're in such a society that doesn't believe in growth or forgiveness. Mm-hmm. You gotta be perfect to be, you, know, you have to be perfect, which is, that is, which also is like, as a brother, like, it's also bullshit because you have a bunch of actors who are still working and not getting called out for all their abusive stuff that they've been doing to their loved ones. Yeah. And he fucked up. He did fuck up. But why should something that he fucked up when he was 17 years old, 18 years old, follow him into his thirties for the rest of his life? It's like, true enough. 
at what at what point do we do we look at the growth and the change and stuff like that? And to be fair, he has done some extra shit that on top <laughs> of it that hasn't helped. Yeah. But I think maybe a lot of that would have been not happen if we had been more of a forgiving society. Uh, True enough. And I guess um, kind of a segue, I'm speaking of forgiveness in the industry. Um, and I don't know if you actually met him, but you definitely worked on a few movies he'd appeared in, um, Robert Downey Jr. Yes, I have met him. And he's a king now. When when mm-hmm. we're on set, he's the king of Marvel Disney sets. Oh, like, yeah. he, has, he has his own little separate section with his own cooks his own makeup team his own trailer we're not allowed to go over there Mm. he invites you over when he wants to hang out with you so on and so forth and he i mean my dude was he he was doing stuff he had no business doing and got caught (laughs) doing it and ruined his name but then he was given a second chance and was able to rise to the occasion and now we have we love him and know him as tony stark (laughs) true enough (laughs) true enough and um and speaking of which, um, on that segue, what was your first um, project with um, Marvel Studios? My first project, so going, that also goes back to my first big break, I guess, into mm-hmm. the film industry as a stunt performer would have been working on Winter Soldier, Captain America Winter Soldier, doing the elevator fight scene. Ah. Um, it was because of the YouTube videos and me being at Jam and White Lotus training in front of these guys and playing these videos in front of these guys. That they were like, yeah, let's let him, uh, let's give him a shot, you know. Uh, James Young, at the time, it was his first time uh, being called in to be a fight choreographer. Hmm. And he was also the stunt double for the Winter Soldier. Uh, he's from the Thousand Pounds group as well. And he was like, you guys need somebody to do this particular move. I know a kid that can do it. I helped him get do like a little previous show, show his work for the coordinator to hire him. So he was trying to pay it forward and they paid it forward and I was given a shot. And that's kind of how it ste- started the steamroll of me working with Marvel. Nice. Man, so that was a, you and what, on screen and you're very one of your first big gigs. Yeah. yeah that's sweet. Right. So, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, um, you took a nice bounce off the wall, I guess. Um, that yes. was you. That was me. That was me. Uh, it's funny because originally it was supposed to be um, like a horizontal. I was supposed to be horizontal and spinning in the air and hanging the- and-, and cracking it. And they had made like a special gator back with mm. metal uh, gro- grooves on it to break the glass. And we just didn't have enough time to shoot that. So that's so the shot that you got me reacting was actually me being like, oh, just they're just like, oh, yeah, just do something for now. And then we're going to get special of you doing the actual move. <laughs> and they're like, nice. no, we're actually going to use that. <laughs> so it worked out. Sweet. And basically, um, and I want to ask you, um, it's a perception of, I guess, let me call him your average movie goer. And, right. um, and this brings me to your appearance on um, Corridor Crew. So now, um, Captain America: Civil War, right? And you're doubling for um, Chadwick Boseman. Yep. I'm, well, I'm more so Black Panther's double. Um, there we go. Kofi Yadam. He was the Chadwick Boseman double because I was considered not dark enough uh, <laughs> to be the double. So I was like, okay, well, oh, I mean, can't ha- can't have it all. <laughs> now, most of your work, um, well, I'm assuming most of it, but you definitely worked on the chase scene. When yes. um, I guess it was in Germany. I'm sorry. Um, yes, we were in Berlin, Germany, and I also did the airport fight. It's sweet. Now that scene, particularly in Germany, I wanted to say um, I guess you were chasing. Well, you and character were chasing Bucky and Captain America, both of you. Yep. So um, that scene brought to light um the actual work you all did and. A lot of people were complaining about this, talking about, oh, it looks phony, CG, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And um, you appear, and it was a lot of very practical work. Like, shockingly, yeah. a lot of it was practical. And um, a lot of people were complaining that it looked too, it's like you slid down a wall. You actually did that. Yes. <laughs> and, and you land, and people were thinking that's um, like, everything is cg and you running behind a car you use um the special mat i forget what it's called magic carpet the magic carpet there we go yeah 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 Yeah, and now so what's your um your thoughts on that when people they're thinking everything well most stuff is but in that particular instance a lot of that is practical what do you think about that criticism 
like toward I, here. I, honestly, I don't blame them because even when I look at it and you see that they are putting like kind of a CG overlay on the costume because they yeah. want the costume to look perfect to a certain way, it kind of then it's like, well, if they did that, then you know it probably isn't real that what they did and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm like. It's cool. It's it's fine for me as long as I get a chance to tell you like actually I did this and right. I actually had the opportunity to be like no this is actually real because it's it is disheartening when you see that especially because I go to I love going to these movies I'm a big fan of comics I'm a big fan of Marvel um, and you go in there and you see the all the hard work that you've done and you have like a sort of PTSD when you get to those <laughs> scenes and it's like oh well it doesn't really look that real anymore because it's right. So they 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 had to make it look as pretty as possible, right? But yeah. it's like no, you actually you actually really lived it. So I it would be cool if they maybe did more of like what Jackie Chan does, <laughs> right? Where they show like the stunt, like the the behind the scenes little snippets, yeah, your little and bloopers that, and whatnot. You know, during, while the credits are rolling or something like that, just to give an idea or do more of uh like behind the scenes segments for stunts, showcasing the crazy stunts that go down, right? Because then, um, you know, give a little bit more of appreciation. But I think all in all, it's it's all about making the best picture possible. And in order for them to do that, they got to make it look as pretty as possible on the CG side. Definitely. um, That was um, well said. And speaking, I'm glad you brought up um, Jackie Jackie Chan, the man. Because I'm going to one of the, um, I'll say, issues with the stunt community Mm -hmm. um, that you all are... Well, a lot of you are having, um, and I agree with actually did a podcast on it. Now, you were speaking to Jackie Chan. We know he does um, a lot of crazy stuff stunt wise and fight choreography wise. Yeah. Now, um, you all, um, stunt personnel, choreographers, are getting no love from the academy. No. And um, it's ridiculous the excuse that they have for not giving you all, um, you know, I mean, I'm a big cinephile, so I actually I love the award season when it comes around. Right. The Academy Awards, there's two sound categories, two documentary categories, and there are special achievement awards. I mean, you all can't even get in there. Nope. And you have, um, of course, you know, the Taurus Stunt Awards. Taurus and, is um, cool. Yeah. And, of course, they – um. But also, and I think somebody from the Academy said, oh, they have that one. They, it'll, it'll be all right. But then again, Screen Actors Guild has um, stunt awards. Yep. Uh, the Emmys has a stunt, have numerous stunt categories. Right. And um, I don't think the Golden Globes have one. But, you know, nope. you all are given, other than those two, the Oscars, um, people, and you got a lot of big people trying to rally for this. You know, um, just to name a few, Jason Statham. Yep. Um Tom Cruise and um, yep. um numerous others. Um so what's your opinion on that? Just that that snub, for lack of a better term, that just I think it's something that is going to change. Um it it's it's like one of those like lasting effects from the past that we're slowly getting through because back in the day it used to be about selling the actor more so as a brand, as a name. Rather mm-hmm. than just being about like, oh, this person's actually playing a story. He's actually being a character. There we go. Um, you know, so it's about it was about building those names up. It's like, oh, well, he does his own stunts because it made him more of a badass, which then makes you want to watch him more, which makes it more believable. But in this in these fictional science fictional stories, we don't need that kind of uh, facade of the actor doing everything it's especially with social media now we know yeah. that that's not the case and i think it just requires people to be more flexible in in their in their viewpoints when it comes to that and eventually it's going to happen i think eventually we'll get we'll get a section in the oscars eventually we'll get a section in the golden globes yeah it's it, it's, it's way past due definitely um but it's going to happen. It, it, it's, it's inevitable because the conversation keeps rising and rising and more people who are coming from this, this viewpoint are getting in those positions where they can make those decisions. Nice. You know, uh, 
it will be cooler if more actors, <laughs> especially those that won Oscars or won Golden Globes, yeah, uh, pushed more and harder because it's so. It's I thought it was really funny that um, a film about a stuntman got an <laughs> Oscar before a stuntman got an Oscar. Yeah, Brad Pitt and then, um. Yeah, it's amazing. I thought that was I thought that was pretty amazing. I'm like, well, all right, fine. That means we're kind of making a step. Yeah, correct? he actually. Yeah, that's um, that's that's nuts. Um, he actually spoke about it during his um speech. Yeah, he did absolutely. So it's just it's it's we're we're getting there. More and more people are saying it, and uh, it'll be interesting to see then what what the what it's going to be because you have it, it's if you do like best stunt, mm -hmm. right? What exactly made it that best? Made it the best stunt? Was it the fact? What did did the writer write that in the script? Or was that created by the stunt coordinator? Or was that actually designed by the stunt rigger? Was like who who goes up there? Right. Yeah. Who gets the actual that? award? Who yeah. gets the actual award? That's mm -hmm. the other thing that we're also looking at. Um, yeah. That and I think once we figure that part out, we'll be able to you know, because then there's also the guys who it, it's also a discrepancy in this in the tourist awards. You have a guy who does the stunt. And it's shown on camera, but there was also a different guy who tested the stunt out to make it safe. So that way, mm. that stunt guy it's a good go point. in and do it, <laughs> right? So it's yeah. just like, all right, so you know, it's it's figuring those things out. And sometimes, like if you pick like best fight scene, or uh, the fight scene may have only been good because of the editing. So does the editor get that? <laughs> yeah, that's a you know? yeah. These are good. These are great points you're making, actually. So it, it, no. it's it. Well, we're we're getting there. We we just <laughs> our <laughs> we're, we're, there's yeah. so many questions that and points that need to get addressed first and figured out, and then we'll we'll get to that point where we actually have a even more solid argument. And by the time we have a more solid argument, we should we should already be in the awards. Sweet. Yeah, I'm hoping so because you all, it's definitely what you all do. In my opinion, I think it's definitely not appreciated. I appreciate. Yeah, um, I mean, today. I appreciate that. No, that's um. Now, that's you spoke of um UALA. Yeah. Um, the short. So, um, to my knowledge, there's three episodes. It's technically three parts, but three it's parts, all yeah. it all makes one pilot episode, or more so, we would like to call it like um, it's more of a a feeler, like a a, a mood type. Uh, concept video to show what we could do we already ha it, it's not connected to the actual story that we have written for a season nah, I um and i mean it was just a bunch of us trying to create something chris cowan uh he's the head director of the project he's also the head of thousand pounds or even x3i and uh me and him were always bouncing back and forth for the past four years while he was working on Kingsman, Kingsman 2, Han Ooh. Solo, Star Wars. He was working on all these different projects and was never home. And I'm like, dude, the moment you get home, we got to shoot something. We got to yeah. shoot something. And we're all anime nerds. Like before he left, we were doing anime expo because of projects like the Naruto dream fight with, mm -hmm. between Naruto and Rock Lee. Um, yeah. We had, we had tried to do our own, Thing with uh, clandestine which was crowdfunded and was set to be two episodes which something happened with the with the with the people that had the rights to it they did something weird and mm -hmm. we couldn't get that done um just so many different doors and loops and hoops and stuff that you gotta sh you gotta just navigate through and finesse your way through in order right. to get something done right um so we did this project uh one, because I literally made him, we, we like sat down in his place and we're just listening to songs and trying to figure out what to do. And he popped on the My Hero track. And he's like, I've been wanting to do something like this. And I'm like, yeah, I've been wanting to do something with a book bag. And I was like, why don't we just do something like My Hero inspired? And he's like, yeah, like that we should, I mean, we're using the song. We definitely should. And he was like, I can do this kind of stuff. I was like, all right, cool. Like I can do this and this and let's get, um, we got to get somebody to come and fight. You know, we got, who, what, what's the story? What are we doing? I'm like, we get, we get our homie Nathan Peoples in. And it was literally just going to be it, funny thing that this was just supposed to be a practice fight. Right. 
it was supposed to be just us like getting the cobweb shaken off of doing something on our own, not having 50,000 people around us helping move a light or something like that. Just going <laughs> back to our roots of passion projects. Right. What was the crew size on that um, project, the UALA? UA, uh, it was just the first uh, part. Part one was just four people, me, mm. Chris, Nathan, and Kalina. Um, and it was just us in a park. Just drove up for three days and just shot it. You know, it took a couple hours a day. That's and amazing. Just got and it that done. Four people. That, that looks better than some stuff I've seen done with 400 people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's also less people having to look at it, you know? So like the director is looking at it and he's also going to edit it. So he's shooting for his edit. Mm -hmm. He knows what he wants to see. Um, <clears throat> you have me choreographing it. So I know what my body can do and I can talk with uh, Nathan and figure out what his body and see where his limitations are and what he wants to do and how he, how, how we can make it all look good. Right. There's not a lot of hats coming at me like, well, we should be facing this way because the lights here. No, we got to move over here because you can't hear the sound and stuff. It's just oh, us going out there and just being absolutely creative and doing it for the love of it. Yeah, and look at um, the, the results of the project. Yeah. Or and the results. So we did it in like anime expo happens right after the first part comes out. And uh, Chris was like, yo, on one of the days you should come and your cost and your backtrack costume. And I was like, okay, like cool. Like we didn't even have a name for the character yet. And the comments were giving us names. The the fan base was was creating the characters for us. They were giving us the quirk names, they were giving us the character names. And we were like, well, this is one of the coolest things to do is just to tie them into it and tie them into the process with us. And literally people were like, so when's the next part? Where what happens next? What right. you guys gotta do another one. And I was like, well, I guess we got to. And Chris was like, yeah, I guess, I guess we're going to have to. And we were with my homie Cleo Thomas. And I was like, Cleo, you want to you wanna, you wanna jump mm. in on this? And he was like, I would be honored to. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, hell yeah. So I was like, boom, we got Cleo. And I was like, all right, we need, let's, let's get, he, Chris was like, we need like two other guys because I, I have these other quirk ideas that I want to do that I can do with mm. my camera effects. I'm like, all right. So I pulled in Jay Kwan and I pulled in Mark uh, Michion, who are both amazing stunt performers and passion project creators as well. Like is Kaleo, um, is he a trained martial artist or did you? No, know? he isn't. So we're training him now so that way in the future <laughs> we can we can get him into some fights, you know. Nice. But we made it so that way his power was so what it was. And we knew that he could bring a caliber of storytelling to the to to the to our platform that you know otherwise you wouldn't you, that you don't need a fight to do you right. know so that was it, it had that dynamic and we also know how badass in anime the the character the, the villain is if he doesn't have to fight it's like oh that guy must be dangerous because he doesn't even have to fight he has other dudes fighting with him <laughs> fighting for him right so uh we created part two and part two star hitting and people were like what no way and chris already we were like we're going to do a part three anyway the moment we knew that we were going to do part two we were going to make a part three right um and it just it worked out people weren't getting called out for work which was cool so it wasn't like any like ah, well chris is gone again for another four years so we're never going to shoot this thing <laughs> it was like boom everybody's going i actually turned down a job so that way i could like I could get this done. Oh, that's cool. Love you. Get this done, you know, because um, you know, like work is great. I love working. I love, I, and, but this is doing it with your friends is so much more fulfilling at times. And I felt like it was something that needed to get done, and we needed to do, and I enjoyed doing it. So why not do it? Yeah, and that's um, um, and that's the awesome thing I respect. I see um, in talking to you about this project. You, it seems a very close knit community, and that's that's awesome. Yeah, as far as the um, your, the stunt performers and even as um, you know, I have a lot of martial arts buddies and you know, we just just an understanding, right? When it comes to the skill and he said the communication and whatnot. And and the cool thing about like a lot of the is so there's like different subcategories in stunts, right? You have your your car guys, you have your high fall guys, you have your doubles, you have your ND guys, and then you also have the guys who I would consider I'm more close tied to, which is the indie stunt world the in the the indie fight community so it's it's the guys who you see all those youtube videos they're producing martial arts content and they're all yeah. based with martial arts background so they all have that same 
passion and drive for martial arts, which I guess even ties us even more closer together, you know? Right. So. No, that's awesome. Man, well, and I hope you all definitely do some more with that because... Yeah, right now we're we're trying we we set up like a little call to action hashtag uh, MHA live action. Um, we're trying to get Legendary's attention to let's come into the room and at least pitch it. You know, mm -hmm. we we have a really cool pitch packet. We have a really cool idea of how we can translate something that uh, we feel people want to see. You know, and the biggest issue that we see in these big Hollywood budgeted films that are doing anime ad adaptations is that they're trying to sell it to a culture that isn't necessarily attached to that culture. Like right. anime culture is Jap is the, the, the comedy, the pacing, the, um, even the way how the acting is, pre is presented is completely different from what we're used to. You know, right. what, what, what we deem to be cringeworthy or not cringeworthy. And you have to take those things into account. And we yeah. feel like we've, we've found the way to mold those two together, you know? And which is what made My Hero so big is the fact that it was a young Japanese writer who looked at Marvel comics, looked at DC comics, and also knew of his culture and, and of manga and of what's going on in his world and was able to find the perfect mesh. So now we have to take that same idea and incorporate it for us to fit us and what right. we look at societally because if you look at my hero like we're the way how japanese people work in their in their country and how they move about amongst each other is completely different from how americans move about amongst each other so we have to put that into a factor like there's no way you're going to be able to tell people don't do something that they feel that is their right to do yeah that's good so yeah. <laughs> right. No, I hear you and and hopefully you do get it through. And um like you said, and when you get a project like that through and people don't understand the culture, you start getting post it notes from people who have no idea. And then it turns into um like um you know, you're a fan of um Avatar, The Last Airbender. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and um that was just <laughs> It's like M Night. Like, dude, did you even watch the show? Did nah, you, he. Did you care for it? Did you like? There was no care, you know. And yeah, he had no idea um, about the source material. He he wrote the movie. And I'm like, yeah, he just took the <laughs> to the mispronunciation of the right basic stuff like that, and yeah, that could have been something special, but it really could have. But it <laughs> also allows us to come out and show them how it's done. Right, give you a chance because that was just whew, which no. hopefully these these companies see, you know, like sometimes they they feel like it's risky bringing in a new director or a young director or a young or a different like a non star in their sense uh, actor and to be the lead, and it's like, well, you can start creating your leads, you can start creating your true, the, you can you can get these these people clearly know what they're doing and they and we're good at it, so it's just like. Give the trust. I understand it's money at the end of the day, but we're also doing art, and this is something that you want to. If if right. if you focus on the art part, the money thing is going to come regardless because people are going to want to buy it. The fact that people are constantly commenting, "Where can we donate for this? Where can we? I give you my money. I give this." Is is like, well, yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> right? If it's good, they're gonna they're gonna buy it. But and, um, speaking of which, you talk about um, you speak of giving somebody a chance is um and you were on winter soldier so um the russo brothers yes um they came from basically they have an the independent TV. background then they did the tv they were comedy like community and rest of development and then right. boom then you get a big action Ex yes yeah, and the so. reason why they the and i think the reason why they were so successful is because they understood the power of collaboration mm-hmm you know? Uh, understanding like, hey, like, yeah, we're good at this, this, and this. We know what we're good at. So let's hire the people that are good at things that we're not good at. And we're doing a superhero action film, espionage film. Right. So we're going to have to really use and piggyback off of the talents of our stunt team. And there was no ego in that. And I wasn't, I was an ND guy, so I wasn't fully 
a part of the the team all the way through the run. But I could tell just off of the first experiences watching them shoot the elevator fight scene that they were completely okay with watching the previs and following the previs and and trusting in the fight coordinator and in the stunt coordinator and choreographer's work and allowing them to do their job. Whereas sometimes you have people that you know their egos get in the way. This yeah, it's it's a it's a heavily egocentric industry that we're in. You know, you have people that run around and call themselves Oscar nominee award winner <laughs> or award winners. You know, and it, it's and and that's human. You know, that's in every industry. If there's an accolade, people are like, "Well, you got to respect the fact that I have this accolade." And it's like, "Yeah, cool. right, absolutely, I respect that." But that's not what we're doing right now. Right now, we're trying to do this and make this dope. And it requires people stepping away. And they were very open to doing that. And nice. I think that's that's why they're as successful as they are. Because they understand where they can learn. That there's still something to learn. There's still something to attain and, and to get from somebody else. And it's okay to to allow those people to do their thing and shine. Sweet. And speaking of the Russo brothers, um, there's another actor, um, I'm going to assume you worked with him, and he had something to say about, um, I guess, um, I guess the culture within um, mm-hmm. the Marvel Studio movies alone. He was speaking specifically um, Anthony Mackie. Right. And he had something to say about the, um, and a, a quote from his. Lack of diversity. Because I've, yeah. I've been constantly tagged. I've been constantly tagged in it. Um, there is a small number. There really, like, honestly, there is, there is a lack, like, when I was on Civil War, you had, uh, in the core team, uh, which consisted of all doubles, you had me and two other brothers on the scene. Mm. So you had me as Black Panther double, Marvin Ross as a Spider-Man double, and Aaron Tony as the Falcon double. Mm. So if you, I, I've, all the other superheroes that are there, there's only three that are black and that's not even including war machine, but oh, war yeah. machine was done by somebody in this. And they're like, well, it's a machine. It's a guy in a suit. So it doesn't really matter. So, so they matter. have, they, sure. they take one of the other guys to double on. It wasn't any of the black dudes either. It was somebody who had to fit the height that they wanted. Right. Mm. And, um, you, you then you're on, I'm on set and you have them and then you have the actors. You have, uh, Chadwick Boseman there, you have Anthony Mackie, and you have uh, Don Cheadle. Mm-hmm. And so that's another, that's that's really six people that are going to be on cam- in front of camera. Now behind camera, there's Camille Friend, who is the head of hair uh, for Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2. She's, she's amazing. So you have a sister there. You have maybe two other black brothers being there as PAs or grips. Mm. So there is a lack of in in the grand spectrum of how many people are there. Right. There's barely there's barely two handfuls of us, you know, and uh, I think people like kind of took him as not not acknowledging certain things. And it's like, no, he he's not talking about us. He's talking about the fact that there weren't any directors that were black put on to these Marvel films until Black Panther happened. There weren't any black ND stunt players much into any of these films because it always calls for us fighting Russians of some sort, or it, you know, it has to be some sort of militant villain. Right. right? And most of the time when they ever think of militant villain or base it in a certain place like Germany, they, they automatically assume it's all white. You know, and then when you look like and me coming from also watching a lot of soccer, a lot of football, I can look at those teams. I look at the national teams. I'm like, it's so much more colorful than how Hollywood perceives it. So it is crazy because Hollywood is only perceiving is is only a picture is only showing what America thinks about everything. So it's like it's constantly perpetuating, you know. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. It's a, it's a vicious mm-hmm. cycle of that. It's like, oh, well, Germany, when we think Germany, we think of these guys and their weird <laughs> little things and their cloggers and shit. And right. they're Caucasian, blonde hair, blue eyed. And it's like, well, no, there's a there's a lot of African descent families that are in Germany. There's a lot of Asian descent families right. in Germany. I know plenty of them. And where we and Hollywood just plays to what America knows because that's what they're trying to sell it to, right? Yeah. 
there's um there's a quote from um, a documentary. Um, it's about Bruce Lee, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, it's on ESPN, the Thirty for Thirty. Be water. Uh, yeah, be water. And I forget yeah. who the gentleman was, but he said um, uh, he was talking about Bruce Lee's movies. Um, I'm paraphrasing a quote, but basically he said um, um, Bruce Lee was treated with racism because the Hollywood system is racist or something like that. But you know, you get the the gist of it. Absolutely. And um, you know, Bruce Lee was one of the few to actually break that broke battle into his movies, yeah. Right, which is also, I think, why he resonates so much with the African-American community, because a lot of his stories were him going against an oppressive uh, system. Him, oh, yeah. Like, you know, the, the Fist of Fury story, the uh, or the Chinese connection, I guess, in a sense, is, yeah. is him fighting the, the Japanese. It's... You know, and it's that's it's then you have Return of the Dragon. It's Chinese people living in Greece and having to deal with the the mob trying to right. oppress them and him fighting for them. So you, it's always that cheer, you know, stuff like that. So yeah. it's um, but saying something. The only time Bruce Lee actually fought another Chinese person was Into the Dragon, um, a, a co-American production. So I guess that's yes, something. It's a, right. It does. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> right. It's it, you know, and that's a thing. Um, it sucks, but you know, I, I look forward to the day when we can stop having films speaking for myself, like that are acknowledged and deemed noteworthy that don't require us to be slaves or to be thugs yeah. or to be, you know, criminals to paint like, why can't there be a black James Bond? Why can't there be, you know, a science fiction story pushed by a black lead? Um, you know, uh, Attack the Block, John Boyega. Uh, oh, yeah. That film is amazing to me. It's still one of my favorite films to watch. Yeah, it is. It's, um, yeah, well, John Boyega is, yeah, they were pushing for they, a sequel for that. I hope they do, but. I hope they do. They did him dirty in Star Wars, in my opinion. <laughs> they did him dirty because I was so excited to see him with that lightsaber and for him to not even mention or talk about, like, after that moment, it was like, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> go over here and go be a side character. Yeah, and um, I think my sister called it, um, John Boyega was in a friend zone far, far away. <laughs> yes. Which was complete, like, it. Oh, man, I don't know how they go <laughs> from what they were doing to Ren and Kylo kissing. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other. I, 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 get, I was like, Ray, how does that happen? <laughs> Ray, sorry. I, like, Ray, I, yeah. I did not see that coming at all. No, but definitely. But um, I guess we could wrap up. It's one more question I have to ask you. You spoke about Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, and any a black martial oh, yeah. artist. Come that, on. Um... <laughs> Come on. You already know who I'm going to say. You already know. Wesley Snipes is the GOAT. Mm-hmm. I actually made a post opinion. about him the other day. Um... I actually met him. Um, which is pretty cool because he has some history with my mom back in the day. They used to date um, back before he got his big break in the film industry. Uh, So I was working on Players, which was a little TV show that he was a part of. I remember CBS show. Yeah, CBS show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember coming in after my fitting to go see him. Uh, He was along with Chuck Jeffries, who's an amazing fight coordinator. And I think Chuck Jeffries, he was on that. Yeah. I love him. Um, Right. Yeah, he talk about somebody who doesn't get credit. None. He gets yeah. at, like it's it's completely it it's it's so annoying because that brings another thing. Like, there's only one black stunt coordinator that I know of right now, and that's Larnell Stovall. Ooh, um, yeah, he works with Michael J. White a lot. If I'm not, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and so Chuck Jeffries, I'm, I'm, he's there. He's he's working with Spike, and I and. Uh, I mean, with Wesley, and I walk up to Wesley, <laughs> and I'm like, "Hey, so you do you remember a, tr- a Tracy, like a Tracy Robinson?" He was like, "Yeah." I was like, "Yeah, back in the day, you went to SUNY Purchase." You know, I I started throwing all this old facts and old old information. He's like, "Yeah." I was like, "Yeah." So it's nice to meet you, Dad. <laughs> 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 he froze so hard. I was like, "I'm wow, kidding." That's- but that you used to name my That was mean, but awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was so mean, but I, I, I had to get him. 
Um, and he's remembered me ever since. And he's, I mean, he was somebody that, you know, one of the first people, I mean, you have Jim Kelly as well, who I also yeah. got to meet. But oh, nice. I had more of an, I had more of an interaction with uh, Wesley and he has had more of an impact on me in my life. Um, I look to him a lot when it comes to being a performer yeah. of what to do and what not to do, you know? So, and that's awesome that um you're now a part of these um superhero movies and people tend to forget that um you know Wesley in the late nineties when there Wesley was no first yeah that we had Blade and first it really was our Marvel comic movie definitely yeah and it and it was actually good um, and the second one too right uh, we don't talk we'll, about the third now we don't <laughs> <laughs> but I'm yeah. Wesley, um, um, definitely a real deal, man. I haven't met him. My father's met him before, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I forget uh, for the life of me who he was, but um, an old timer, um, sensei passed away, and uh, Wesley came to pay his respects. And he, my father told me he was one of the most down to earth dudes you will ever like, Absolutely. you know, walking in, but yeah, that's but now, yeah, Wesley, um, yeah, doesn't get the credit, well. As a martial artist, um, people, a lot of people accuse him of being a movie martial artist, and yeah, he's a martial artist. Yeah, he's a re- he's a real, real deal. <laughs> like he, I mean, he's the only person too in screen fighting that can forget the choreography and make it look good. Yeah, that's that's his his, his pause. His pause is his tell. Whenever you see him do the pause, you're like, oh, but it's you so see much a lot of that on the screen. It. That's um. It, it's so much flavor. The way how he does it though, yeah. which is is so it it's a it, it reminds me to when I was like street dancing and a friend of mine, um, uh, I think, yeah, he told me, he was like, it doesn't matter how many moves you have. It matters how you do the moves that you do have. Mm. So I've always walked around with that intent, you know, and it's Doug, Doug Elkins instilled the, the whole idea of being an army Swiss knife, having all the tool, having as many tools as possible that you can pull from and use, you know, to, to create whatever it is that you're creating. And that's, that's, those two things have pushed me to where I am now. And hopefully it'll push me further as I push into my, uh, my thirties, you know, so. Nice. No, so good old Wesley Snipes. And um, uh, what's your opinion on, I got to ask you this, uh, Michael Jow White. I really like Michael J. White. Um, I've worked with him once. Oh, well, uh, what was this on? This was uh, Android Cop. It was some really bad movie. <laughs> I thing. remember. I, mean, I, I saw probably like a yeah, uh, snippet or something. Shot of Netflix. I, and the only thing, I doubled him for driving the car around. They needed, they needed him somewhere else, so they had me driving the car around with the actor it, through the thing, doing something. And... Uh, He's always been, he's somebody else who I also feel hasn't been given the recognition that he deserves. No, because not he, at all. he also was technically the first anti hero, black anti hero to be on film. So they spawn, spawn, right? Yeah. And, you know, then and after Spawn happens, he disappears. And for me in my life, I'm sure he's doing a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, he's now producing and writing his own, his own content. Yeah. which is cool but hollywood has kind of like kept them out and it's like well what what's that about so yeah it's funny and um he did a movie and thanks to michael J. white scott atkins is a thing right and, absolutely because um, J. white actually says do you think you could find us a white version of you right and, he was and like, boom scott atkins <laughs> and scott atkins was a stunt guy first yeah that definitely um yeah, I recognize his um his old stunt work. He would just get knocked yep. out by Matt Damon and <laughs> Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But no, um but no, I think um definitely got well, way, way more than enough. I didn't mean to take that much of your time. Just, oh, it's all good, brother. <laughs> just chopping it up and stuff. But um no, it's a great combo. Definitely put something nice together with this, and I appreciate you giving us <laughs> this interview. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I'm yeah, actually no. honored that I'm even thought of to be like a part of the opening of this website. Like, oh no, it's um <laughs> me of all people, right? Like, <laughs> I'm trying to become the action star, but right now I'm just you know I'm just a wannabe. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so no, yeah. there. 
you are a heck of a lot closer than a lot of us and hopefully you help us open some doors for for more and more people that's the goal man you mm -hmm. know there was there was like a handful of black stuntmen when i first got into the industry and black panther opened up the door for so many more people so definitely like, so if i can keep helping and being a part of that growth for us and showing a new avenue uh as well as creating a new lane i'm that's what i'm pushing for you know i want to be that beacon of inspiration yeah definitely and sweet and speaking speaking of black Panther, i don't think i asked you directly did you work on that no i didn't hmm. i did not get to work on that that was actually done by one of my best friends danny graham he was the stunt uh -huh. double for it and then which is funny because going back to me living in a two bedroom with five guys he's one of the five. Oh wow <laughs> and then the the stunt double for black panther in the infinity war and endgame was another roommate in that two bedroom with the five <laughs> of us so we're we just bred a whole bunch of black panther right. doubles. Uh, that's crazy but um what was the last mc movie you worked on that would be endgame if i'm not mistaken yes, or endgame i believe it was endgame now um now to make the people more familiar with um i think i have a good idea of what um a utility stuntman is yes if that's still a word a phrase i don't want yeah to... it is it's still used mm. so the utility stunt guy is you know the dude that can step in and just do the the little goon work who can run up in a in a balaclava with the helmet on and <laughs> get beat up by the hero get back up put on another costume and do it again oh, and sweet. then if you need him to double he'll be the double <laughs> nice all right now would you ever work on um in a hong kong uh, movie? oh man i want to be in a jackie chan film so bad i want to yeah. work i want to actually meet him in person and work with him as long as well as donnie Yen, um and samuel hung i think those are those are the three people that if i get to meet them in my career run into them in my career I will have said that I've completed everything I want to complete. <laughs> Black Panther was already like something on, of a milestone for me, mm -hmm. uh, being able to play that. And like after, I, it won't, I'm already happy with life as it, I'm like, if I could, if I die tomorrow, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's a lot of people cannot say that like, right. at all. And so, and at um, your young age, uh, well, how old are you? If you don't mind me asking. Actually, I just turned 30 on Sunday. Oh, so you're a young, young man. Yeah, I got a lot of work ahead of me. <laughs> got a lot of growing. Got a lot of growing. So too. you're willing, you're willing to let Donnie Yen, of course, um, I'm pretty sure you're familiar, have heard a thing or two about um how they do it over there in Hong Kong. Um, oh yeah. So basically, Absolutely. if you're not on, you could be on set, but if you're not in front of the camera, you don't get paid. You don't get paid. That's not gonna be me though. They're gonna put me <laughs> on camera. They, if they're if they're flying me in, they're gonna use me. <laughs> so you're willing to take um Donnie Yen has um a reputation. Of knocking like people out. Yeah, he 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 gives bonuses for um. It's called stunt adjustment. That's just, it stunt happens, adjustment. It there. happens out here too. <laughs> it just <laughs> it's just not the actor being like, hey, I'll give you some money out of my pocket. Yeah, Donnie Yen is known for you know up front like, I give you this if you let me punch you out. That's crazy, and that's yeah. that's dedication. But right, it's it, it's full on dedication. Uh, the stunt people out there are complete. Uh, completely different beings you know jackie chan has his stunt team and he trains mm -hmm. them and they're trained hard and brought up through the yeah. ranks and and constantly work so you know uh yeah. i think i think if i'm to go out there it probably wouldn't be to just be a stuntman it'll probably be more so as an actor mm -hmm. uh which is what i've been nice. pushing for a lot recently um i've been taking the classes doing the work treating it with as mu with as much respect as i treat anything else that cool. I do, you know, like full on devotion and putting the work in. So Yeah, well definitely when this pandemic <laughs> so <you're a> wannabe. <laughs> and trust me, that's funny you call yourself the wannabe. There's a lot of wannabes who wanna be you. I mean the position you're in, which right. I <laughs> there's it levels to it. Levels. It's right, so many it's like it's like game of death. There's levels in the pagoda. There we go. So. But now but that lets you know you're accomplishing something if you steady trying to get to that higher level that's guess right. that's what it's all about exactly. just like martial arts itself right exactly yeah it's like <laughs> okay i got my black belt that's not the end of the that's actually a beginning of another journey so right oh i learned that one the hard way <laughs> right <laughs> I, I thought i was a badass when i got my first black belt and i got humbled but that's another story <laughs> right that's a story we should talk about that'd be fun definitely we shall 
But um, no, I guess um, um, like I said, ten minutes ago, I got everything I needed. <laughs> okay, dope. Hell yeah, sweet. But um, once again, definitely appreciate you, and we'll when we get launched, um, I'm gonna have a sweet spot on you. So I appreciate with this that. thing. But um, stay safe, man, and um, thank you, you too, and hopefully talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Hit me up uh, whenever. All cool. right, brother. Take it easy. Nice meeting you. And you as well. <laughs>